to our Saddleback webinar this week. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. We have a great topic for you today. Again, another highly requested topic with a return presenter, Orly Klappholtz here to tackle a, a very complicated topic. Uh, so we'll bring her in in a moment. But as you are logging in today, uh, I just want to draw your attention to the control bar, which is on the bottom of your web browser window. Now, I know we all know how to chat using Zoom webinar these days. There's probably no tutorial required for that. So just a friendly reminder that when you want to chat with us today, that you select panelists and attendees from the little drop down there before you hit send. This will ensure that everybody who is online with us today will be able to see your comments. Otherwise, just a handful of us at Saddleback will, will see your thoughts. The chat area is also where we, will, where we will drop links to resources for you today, so be on the lookout for that. And we anticipate a lot of questions today, so go ahead and find that Q&A area on the control bar. Anytime you have a question either for Orly or for Saddleback, go ahead and put it in there for us. Uh, but just a warning, I'm going to ask for your patience because we think we're going to um, hold most content-oriented questions for the end today, uh, just because there is um, a lot of information and a lot of um, just a lot that we want to cover today. So uh, we just ask for your patience on that. And please remember, we now have our subtitles uh, enabled on Zoom webinar. So if you'd like to take advantage of that, please, cl please click live transcript on your control bar and then select show subtitle. This is where you can find us on Twitter. Many of you are probably here today because uh, you saw Orly tweeting about this webinar. So she's, <laughs> <laughs> she's very active on Twitter. And we like to think that we are too. So please follow us, say hello, let everybody know you are joining us for this learning opportunity today. And if you happen to be catching the recording later, don't be shy. You can still go to Twitter, let us know you watched it, let us know your thoughts, let us know if you have questions. Uh, we always love to hear from you. We will get started in just about another minute. So let's say hi to Orly. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing well, thanks Liz, how are you? I am great. I am going to see who is joining. Oh, Vivian is here. Hi, Vivian. All right. Yes, please make sure that you select panelists and attendees before you hit send on the chat. This is just a gentle reminder. Rowena is here. Hello. Thank you. Great. It's great to see everybody. All right. This is going to be such an informative topic. And by the way, this is our third webinar on this topic uh, because there is so much to say on this topic and there's so many different pieces um, of, of information. So um, if, if you need more information, we're happy to answer more questions, but please check out our YouTube channel and find our previous webinars um, uh, on, this, on this topic as well. So hi, Michigan, Northeast Texas, Connecticut. Everybody's here, North Carolina. <laughs> I love it. Hi, everybody. This is great. Okay, it is time to, I can't believe it's time to start already. Okay. I know. <laughs> this is, I, I could just hang out here for like the next five <laughs> minutes saying hi to everybody, but we've got business to get to. So, so let's get to it. Our topic today is multilingual learners in special education. Huge topic, huge, very complex. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the process and of course the practicalities, which um, it's, it's hard to balance because sometimes we can't really understand what the practicalities are unless we know what the process is. And it's, so there's, there's a lot. We're, Orly is here to help us, <laughs> help us figure all this out uh, as best we can. So she is a return presenter with us. And uh, if you don't know her, she founded Multilinguals Forward in 2019 to bridge the vast gaps in educational research and action for multilingual students. She has experience creating specialized curriculum, pairing grade level content with foundational skills, and facilitating professional development in best practices for SLIFE. She worked as a classroom teacher and special education coordinator working with SLIFE and newcomers. So she's well versed in this topic and we are thankful that you are here to share your thoughts and try to help us piece all this together because it's been a hard year and next year is going to get even more complicated, um, I think. So <laughs> thank yeah. you, I will let you take it from here. Great, thank you so much, Liz. Everyone give me one second while I get the PowerPoint up. Here we go. And present. Great. All right, looks good. We can see it. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for being here. Um, 
I'm really excited to talk about this really complex topic with you uh, and hopefully answer any questions that you may have. Before we get started, I do want to point out, like Liz mentioned, really just how complex this topic is. And so we're going to uh, run through some scenarios. We're going to talk about the process. We're going to uh, learn a little history together. Uh, and then we're going to try and answer questions as best as possible. But I really wanted to make sure to point out that so many questions that you may have, so many of the answers to your questions are really complex. Um, and uh, oftentimes unique depending on the situation. Uh, and it's just something we definitely want to keep in mind. Uh, please, you know, as Liz mentioned, as questions do come up, definitely put them in the chat. Uh, and I'm excited to learn with you all today. Um, we're going to really start with talking about the history of Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, also known as IDEA. Um, and the reason why it's important to really understand this history first is because prior to 1954, exclusion was really the rule. And in any large system, right, where nothing is ever perfect. Um, and so, you know, when we think about the system of special education and, and education in general, right, it's not a perfect system. Uh, we definitely work to do our best, but I think it's really important for us to remember just how monumental uh, IDEA is uh, and was when it was first enacted um, and to really appreciate that the type of legislation that it is and, and where we were and how far we've come, even though at the same time, we definitely have uh, you know, more to do and, and, and uh, more to accomplish. And so when we think about um, exclusion being the rule, there were hundreds of thousands of kids, right, who were institutionalized, who were uh, either sent away from home or taken from their homes. Uh, and those, are, those were kids who were not, when we think about children with disabilities, were not just children, for example, with a physical disability. Those were also children with sometimes a learning disability, which is often viewed as almost an invisible disability. Um, and so those children, so many of them were institutionalized. And I, I'm pointing to these two specific cases in 1893 and 1919 to show you, even from um, a legislative perspective, how these, uh, you know, exclusion was really the rule. So in 1893, the uh, Supreme Court in Massachusetts actually upheld the decision of a school to uh, exclude, to um, expel a child because they were not reaching um, what they considered academic um, achievement. Um, so that really points to, uh, that's one of the earliest cases we really see that happening, but they, right, the idea was that if the student couldn't perform academically, whatever that meant, so therefore the student shouldn't be in school. And in 1919, um, the uh, Supreme Court in Wisconsin also upheld a decision to exclude a child because the student had uh, cerebral palsy. And so you really see prior to 1954, the uh, case after case of uh, courts upholding exclusion and the idea of exclusion. In 1954, I'm sure you all have heard of Brown versus Board of Education, that landmark case, uh, which really um, showed that separate but equal that was established by Plessy versus Ferguson um, goes against the 14th Amendment. And uh, in that landmark case, showing that uh, from a legal perspective, as a legal matter, that uh, segregation uh, based on race uh, is not legal, right? Uh, the reason that case is so important for disability advocates is because it actually set the precedent to then create the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act. That case set the in motion really uh, for advocates to say, we should not be uh, creating a situation in which children with disabilities are not allowed to be in school, right? They are also allowed in school and saying that they shouldn't be in school is also against the 14th Amendment. Um, and so it's really uh, from 1954 onward that you that's where you start to see case after case after case using Brown versus Board of Education as well as the 14th Amendment to uh, prove and to show from a legal perspective these students belong in school and they deserve an education. And that's where you then get to, in 1975 was really the first form, uh, even though it was 
uh, rewritten, reestablished in 1994, but you have really the first form of IDEA, of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and the idea of the free appropriate public education. And so really understanding this history and, and how far we've come, even though we have you know more to do, more to go, is really important because it shows how uh, we really went from a place of like full exclusion and, and that being the rule to this place of, while we may not be perfect, uh, the idea of inclusion, right, um, is, is really what we're focusing on and making sure that every child uh, is getting what they need in our public school system is really very important. I wanted to show you a little bit of uh, the legislation just so that we really know who we're talking about when we say a child with a disability. What does that mean from a legal perspective? Uh, and again, IDEA, right, it's dense, it's legal speak, um, and it's very long. But I wanted to just show you this particular piece so that we're really fully aware of who we're talking about. So it says, right, that the term child with a disability means a child either right with intellectual disabilities, hearing impairments, including deafness, speech or language impairments, visual impairments, including blindness, serious emotional disturbance referred to in this chapter, right at this point as emotional disturbance, orthopedic impairments, autism, traumatic brain injury, other health impairments, or specific learning disabilities. And right, so it could be any or a combination of any of those things and who by reason thereof needs special education and related services. There are really four parts uh, specifically to IDEA. So the part A is really where all those terms are defined. Part B are the educational guidelines for children three to 21 and the financial support uh, that schools are given based on compliance of six criteria. So um, when schools don't have, aren't within compliance, this is why compliance is, one of the reasons compliance is so important is because of funding, right? So if your school is out of compliance, so you will not get that funding or you may get that funding taken away. Uh, and that's why, again, right, when you work in, in any field that, right, that you need to make sure you're within compliance, uh, knowing that and knowing the law is so important. Part C is the uh, birth to two years old. And I want to point out here when we think about our multilingual learners, uh, how important right language support and language access is even, of course, in the classroom right as educators we think about that all the time, but beyond the classroom. Um, I think a lot of times about one time when I was taking one of my children to the doctor and someone there spoke a language that uh, the secretary felt like they couldn't, I don't know, help them. And I sat with them and I was just thinking about how this person is bringing their child right to to the doctor and they don't the doctor's offices even though they're supposed to right are not servicing them um, in the language that they need and how much can get lost really um, and when you think about for example a child who may need um, certain evaluations from birth to two years old or a parent a caregiver anyone who really has any concern that piece of IDEA that specifically says by law, they have to be taken care of um, when it comes to any of these pieces. Uh, we really need to make sure that those kids are getting uh, full language support outside of school, but within their communities, uh, doctor's offices, um, psychological services, which whatever it is that they're really getting that full language support. Um, and then part D are the national activities such as grants and transitional services that support children with disabilities, right? So thinking about uh, post-school opportunities um, as well as just in general outside of school opportunities. When we're talking about FAPE or free appropriate public education, um, it's really important for uh, any caregiver and uh, any educator to know that the, this is one of the most important legal rights uh, a child really has is this that piece of IDEA, right? It's not just that uh, we believe that students uh, who have uh, any type of disability should be serviced, but it's that they are by law, uh, you know, have the right to a free and appropriate uh, public education. And knowing that is what really can help with making sure that we are partners with caregivers, uh, partners between schools, let's say the special education team, as well as the various teachers um, and the caregivers, caregivers themselves. So the question then becomes, what is included in FAPE or, or what, what does it really mean? And um, so the first part is that special education services must meet the unique needs of that specific child. Um, now that doesn't mean that, for example, if I say I want the student to have a Norton Gillingham 
uh, reading program. That's not what that would mean. Uh, but it would mean that, for example, if they're like if you go to the third box or in the middle, right, the accommodations and modifications, if that's the way the child is going to access the curriculum, then that is what uh, the services to meet those unique needs. Um, we need to provide related services such as OT or occupational therapy or speech and language services. Uh, a student, if they need any kind of accommodation, right, so changing how the student is taught, for example, an audiobook or modifications, so changing what the student is taught. Uh, so for example, possibly changing the curriculum as well as their full individualized education plan and in the least restrictive environment. And I want to point out here, uh, because we're all, I'm sure, pretty familiar with the idea of the least restrictive environment, but the, the LRE, or the least restrictive environment, is specific to each student, right? So that does not mean that student A and student B are both going to have the same environment, they may need very different things. Um, and one of the reasons why we really want to think about this, particularly for our multilingual learners, is making sure that um, they have, when we're thinking about evaluating or referring, that when we think about that least restrictive environment, if someone is suggesting, for example, um, a more restrictive environment, then we definitely want to think about why that is and make sure we are really uh, pushing back before we determine that a student should be in, in a very restrictive environment. We always want to start with the least and then if figure out if someone says, right, well, they can't uh, be in that environment, uh, better understand why that is before uh, making any determination. I also wanted to point out here before continuing that the idea of what an appropriate education is, um, is really subjective. And it is the unfortunate reality that right now in the United States, education and education as a right is not really part of the Constitution. And it was really left up to the states. Uh, they're actually, which is why when you see court case after court case of um, individuals saying, let's say, like, you, uh, the school district maybe didn't uh, educate me the way I would have expected or whatever it is, it doesn't really get much movement. Um, there was recently a case in the last two years, was one of the first times it's completely unprecedented um, of students who were actually suing the state to say that their the education they were given was not essentially appropriate. Um, these were not students um, who were uh, students with disabilities. And it was really one of the first, it is the first time um, that they, uh, in the Sixth Circuit, they were, they actually ruled in accordance with the students. Um, once it got to the next court, uh, it was not ruled um, to the students, but it really started this conversation of what does it mean to have a right to an education and what does it mean to have a right to an appropriate education? Um, and that is definitely something we do want to think of as we educate our students, uh, particularly our multilingual learners um, who may or may not right, uh, qualify for special education services. Um, when we think about appropriate education, right, uh, as, as mentioned in supporting English language learners in the classroom, a full appropriate education for our multilinguals is based on the understanding of each student's cultural and linguistic experiences and bridging those to instruction. And as educators of multilingual students, right? You guys know this, right? You're fully aware of that and how important that is and you do that in your classrooms. Um, and when we think about uh, making a referral for special education, for example, though, we want to make sure that we're recognizing that each of these aspects needs to be a part of, um, uh, of that team that's questioning why is this student being referred uh, for special education and how um, if we're not bridging the cultural and the linguistic experiences and their lived experiences, all those pieces to the instruction, then where really is this referral coming from, right? Um, we need to first look at the instruction itself and how we're supporting our multilingual learners first. I want to talk about overrepresentation and underrepresentation of multilingual learners in special education. We actually see both with our multilingual learners. And you might be wondering, what do you mean we see both? How could you possibly see an overrepresentation and an underrepresentation? Uh, but what's really interesting is when you do read the, you know, from a statistical standpoint, when you read, uh, you know, the most recent data, um, anyone who does uh, follow me on Twitter knows I, I tweet a lot about data. Um, I really like data. <laughs> um, and, uh, but when you look at it, it's really interesting because you have that which talks about the overrepresentation 
and the underrepresentation. And you see that because either you'll see a lack of services, for example, let's say our multilingual learners are not being serviced appropriately uh, from a linguistic perspective. Um, you will see a lack of valid assessments. This is a really, uh, really challenging topic and complex topic, the idea of assessment validity, um, at, not just in terms of uh, language, but in terms of who it's normed with, right? Who are these assessments normed with, right? So even if all of these assessments are normed with someone who speaks the same language, it still may not be um, a valid or appropriate assessment for this student. Um, not understanding instructional needs, uh, right? So a teacher may say, you know, the student is not understanding, so they need a referral. Uh, but that teacher maybe isn't um, fully understanding the student, what the student needs in the classroom, and therefore is not giving it to them. Uh, differentiating between English acquisition and learning disabilities, this is uh, unfortunately a huge one, right? Um, so many teachers will say, well, they're not understanding English, they've been here, let's say, four months or however long, so they must be, uh, you know, they need to go be referred uh, or they need to be evaluated. And the reality is, no, that's not, that's not the case. It could be, maybe, depending on the student. Uh, lack of understanding of culture, right? So you definitely see, um, obviously, different cultures have uh, different emphasis on different things, academics, behavior, right? So not fully understanding a culture oftentimes will lead to overrepresentation of uh, our multilingual population as well, as well as bias, right? So oftentimes, we do see students who um, are our multilingual learners, and they may end up in a certain setting and teachers who just kind of off the bat uh, say, ah, I know already this kid probably needs to be evaluated. Um, and so it's really important that we take each of those into account, uh, again, with a team, um, as we're thinking about whether or not a student needs to be evaluated for special education. When it comes to the underrepresentation, this is actually really important and something we kind of need to, uh, I would say, like, check ourselves on also is the idea of the wait and see approach. Um, and each of these uh, bullet points really kind of uh, mesh together, they work together. So there's the, the wait and see as like uh, people saying, oh, you know what, just give them more time, maybe they'll get it or maybe this, or maybe they'll start this or, um, and so, but that oftentimes it, if there is a concern, right, there, and, and we take the wait and see approach, so then maybe we're not giving them the, the, the evaluation or the services that really they need and deserve. And, um, as a result, we don't end up getting in there when we need to, right? We know how much, um, you know, early identification um, and early access to services is so vital. Um, and so the wait and see approach can really uh, be an issue, especially, again, the younger versus older grades, you will often see, particularly with the multilingual population, students who will not be referred uh, younger, but will be referred older. And so it, it fits in with the wait and see, right? So maybe you have a student who um, uh, someone is concerned about and uh, they wait and they wait and they wait and wait and then finally they get to an older grade and they're like oh this student really needs to be evaluated and then the fear of misidentification right so we know how overrepresented our multilingual population is so we may have this fear of I don't want to misidentify student right I don't want to make it seem like I am biased and think this kid needs to be evaluated when they really don't and so we oftentimes will start thinking in those terms of, oh, I probably shouldn't even say anything because, um, you know, I, I don't want this kid to be misidentified. And so I think that for us as educators, the one of the most important things uh, for our multilingual population, particularly those uh, who may need special education services, is being curious, right? Um, I am curious, right, about whether this student uh, how the student is progressing, let's say, in my classroom. I am curious about this student's culture. I am curious about this student's language. And so I think the idea of being curious is what really helps us to fully support kids because it help, It kind of like acts as like a check on, uh, on the bias, on the jumping to conclusions. It's, um, hmm, this student really struggled uh, with, let's say, this assessment. I am really curious why that is. And that's when I start to ask questions. Hmm, could it be my instruction? Could it be the student was having a bad day? Could it be they did, right? Could, it could be a lot of different things, but the idea of curiosity um, and using that as the starting point um, is what one of the things that will really help with both the side of overrepresentation as well as the underrepresentation. Um, Jeanette Klingner really talks about this idea of considering all possible alternative explanations to a student's struggle. 
including the possibility that instruction might not be appropriate before thinking that child might have a learning disability. And this really also does get back to the idea, again, of curiosity, right? Um, a student is ha you know, having a challenging time in my class for whatever reason. I am going to be curious before I'm going to jump to any conclusions my first, my like gut instinct should be the curiosity, right? What, what is going on here? Um, uh, what is uh, creating these, these challenges? So again, it's kind of that, that uh, the curiosity first, uh, going through all of these different tiers, which we're going to get to before we say, mm, this child might have a learning disability. Um, she also points to, and this is from um, Jeanette Klinger, she points to some of the similarities between, for example, um, a learning disability and language acquisition. I'm sure many of you are very well aware of, of these, uh, but they're important to go through and to realize just how similar some of the behaviors are, as well as cultural characteristics, um, and why so much of that overrepresentation happens, because when we don't know, and again, as I mentioned much earlier, this is such a complex topic of the language acquisition um, and learning disabilities, but when we don't know how, for example, acquiring an L2 can look or sound, um, then we oftentimes will jump to conclusions. And um, we really want to, as much as possible, obviously avoid that. So for example, difficulty following directions. And this is, I know I you know, just said this a bunch, but it's really, again, why that, the idea of curiosity, right? My student didn't follow directions. I wonder why that is, right? I am curious about why that is. Is it because, right, I didn't say the directions slowly enough? Is it because they need more um, language support? So really, again, being curious, but those are examples of things that uh, can be um, a struggle uh, for students who are acquiring a second language or students who have a learning disability, right? Difficulty with uh, phonological awareness, for example, right? Um, distinguishing between sounds, um, learning the sound to symbol correspondence. And these, by the way, are some examples of when we have a student learning to read for the first time, um, we really, really want to be mindful of uh, what that looks like in an L1 and an L2. And of course, again, this is a very complex topic, but understanding that, again, if we take it from a place of curiosity versus a child needs to be evaluated now, um, and making this a team approach is how we can really make sure that kids who really do need to be evaluated at a younger age will get those services. And then students who do not need an evaluation, do not need a referral, uh, will not get one. And we really wanna make sure that we are um, being very well aware of what that looks like, right? Um, so, or like difficulty retelling a story in sequence, right? So that could be um, a student, maybe they have a learning disability, um, or maybe I'm asking, a student to do that in English, but they don't really have the expressive skills yet, right? So that's why we really need to be very mindful. And also, again, why this is a team approach. This should never be only one teacher saying, um, I think this. This is a completely, completely a team approach. Um, cultural characteristics, right? Viewing time differently, a collectivist versus individualistic cultures, right? So a student may say, I, Right, coming from a culture that's collectivist, they may not realize that they can't all work on an exam together or a project or or what one teacher might call like cheating, right? That's very different depending on what type of culture you come from. Um, and recognizing that as well, ways of showing respect are very different. Um, significance of school, sharing belongings, all of those different cultural characteristics um, and what they look like in different cultures that we really want to be mindful of. Um, again, goes back to the curiosity, right? I wonder why the student did that. And it's something we also want to, the way we look at behavior, right? What, what is underlying that behavior? Is there a cultural characteristic here? Um, is there something else going on? Is there a trauma here? Uh, that would not mean to refer a student to special education, but is there something I need to be aware of here? And uh, really thinking about both academic uh, and the social emotional behavior piece as what what is really underlying all of this uh, before saying mm, this kid needs an evaluation or jumping to any kind of referral process. Uh, all students who have academic challenges, right, should be provided support early. And again, this is why the whole uh, needing to work as a team. And I know that 
some of you are probably thinking, well, that's really easier said than done in my school. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit when we get to the scenarios. But I do want to say that as someone who has worked as a special education coordinator, uh, particularly in a school for multilingual learners, it is it is complex. It is hard. Uh, a lot of personalities um, and and making sure everyone is working kind of as a well-oiled machine to make sure kids are really being supported as best they can. I want to point out, yes, it is complex um, and can be very challenging, but there are definitely steps that we can take in order to make sure that our students are fully supported uh, by everyone in the school. Just to quickly go through this process so that we're all on the same page for anyone who hasn't had experience with this, the initial referral for evaluation uh, begins, let's say, when either a caregiver or a teacher or I guess, you know, anyone in the school says, uh, this student, let's say, we've, I've tried all these interventions, um, I've, here's the data, for example, um, this student, I think the student needs a referral, right, should be referred for an evaluation. Um, Assuming that the team says, yes, the, the, that makes sense, the student should be referred uh, for an evaluation, the school then needs to send informed, needs informed and written consent for evaluation from a legal guardian, from a caregiver. There is also a time frame, so schools can't just wait around, right? If someone, once that referral process starts, there is a clock. Um, and so, from a legal perspective, like schools have to get on it. Um, they cannot do an evaluation without written, uh, informed and written consent. Then the evaluation happens. I wanna point out that the evaluation, again, this is complex, but we're not talking about one evaluation. Um, it should not be, it should never be that the school psychologist, for example, um, evaluates a student and uses that one evaluation to determine eligibility for any type of uh, disability. That is not appropriate for, for definitely for our bilingual learners, but for any child, any child who is going through the evaluation process to determine eligibility uh, for special education services and an IEP should have several different types of evaluations as well as discussions with teachers, more than one teacher, um, as well for our multilingual learners, particularly the ESL teacher or the ELD specialist uh, need to be involved in this process, um, as well as caregivers. We want to always think about partnering with families, no matter what language they speak. Um, and I, yes, I do wanna point out, I'm sure some of you are thinking, you know, there is stigma, let's say, around this uh, in certain cultures. Um, and so I think that definitely taking that into account is really important and making sure to have those conversations, to open up the conversations, um, to be as transparent as possible uh, with caregivers, with legal guardians is extremely, extremely important in the entire process here. Uh, then you have the IEP meeting. Again, I wanna point out there, a student who is a multilingual learner should have, first of all, a, a trained translator if needed. Um, so the idea of, for example, pulling in another student who speaks that student's language last minute is not appropriate uh, in order to get an IEP meeting done. And uh, we should be aware of a student's right to have that translator, um, uh, pr trained professional uh, interpreter really uh, at that meeting. Um, a caregiver uh, is supposed to be there as well as, again, an ESL or ELD specialist in order to make sure that a multilingual learner is fully supported um, through the IEP process. Then there's the writing the IEP uh, and then right, giving the services as well as the progress monitoring. In terms of the process for appropriate special education referrals, um, we have these different tiers, right? So tier one is really the gathering the information. We're talking about the core instruction. We really want to make sure that core instruction is appropriate um, in all forms, right, for these students. We want to make sure that the assessments are valid and reliable, that we have long and short goals, and we're monitoring progress. I want to point out that sometimes there is a misunderstanding that you have to get through tier three in order for a student to be evaluated. That is not accurate. If within tier one, right, uh, someone says, listen, um, I'm really concerned about this student because of X, right? Um, already that means the process is starting. We should not be waiting until, let's say, the end of tier three uh, to determine whether or not a student needs an evaluation. You really, and this is actually written within IDEA, that we should not be waiting until a student has, let's say, completely failed to say, 
now they need to be evaluated. And that's really important for us to take, uh, to remember that and take that into account. Uh, when it comes to culturally and linguistic appropriate interventions, right, we definitely want to think about that within tier two, uh, if um, it's really connected to tier one, as well as comparing progress to true peers. That's really important also, is what does this look like to a true, uh, compare to a true peer um, at their grade and age level? And then, right, then we have the tier three is referring for special education evaluation, as I said, including the ELD specialist within decisions and caregivers, um, all of those aspects really being important to the IEP uh, team, the IEP process, um, and the evaluation itself. I want to point out these two high incidence categories for multilingual learners specifically. Um, the reason why you have uh, overrepresentation in specific learning disability as well as speech and language impairment is because of English language proficiency. So when a student may not be, uh, and I'm putting in quotation marks, progressing um, in their English language proficiency in, this, in a way that a teacher may expect or maybe they saw another student do, oftentimes they'll hear, great, let's evaluate them. Um, and we want to be really, really mindful of uh, the, the definitions of what a specific learning disability is, as well as speech and language impairment. So I just want to go over them um, before we continue so that we know what we're talking about, right? So a specific learning disability, uh, the term means a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or in using language, spoken or written, that may manifest itself in an imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations, right? So specific learning disability, oftentimes you'll hear, for example, like dyslexia uh, or dyscalculia. Uh, those are part of that, um, that definition. So we definitely want to be thinking about, uh, this is part of that, right? Documented academic skills below grade level, um, a weakness in basic processing area or cognitive weakness, uh, relative strength in some cognitive abilities, right? So you are not talking about um, you could be talking about, for example, sorry, a student who uh, struggles in reading but is really good in math. You could have a student who struggles in both, right? It's a, this, it is so complex, it is so student dependent um, that it's really important that we realize, especially for our multilingual learners, this could really look very different um, depending on uh, what's going on in their brain. And then speech and language impairment being a communication disorder such as stuttering, impaired articulation, a language impairment, or a voice impairment that adversely affect the child's educational performance. I've had many teachers say to me, let's say this student should be evaluated because they aren't speaking. And as educators as of multilingual learners, we're like, okay, so they're not speaking yet, right? They're not speaking yet. Um, they may not be ready to speak. And so recognizing and going over kind of the definitions and understanding really what these definitions mean, and then what is typical English language development is really important for teachers to see to be able to understand does this kid really need a referral or not and again looking at these from uh, the view of curiosity of being curious right of what's going on why isn't my student speaking yet right oh they are new to the country that is very typical right and that is very normal um or maybe the student comes from a culture where they this is not typical for them to uh, to uh, speak up in the classroom in this form and so we really want to be very mindful of those because these are really the very high incidence category specifically for our multilingual learners I, I get this question a lot and I uh, want to quickly go over why students with limited or interrupted formal education do not qualify for special education. The, at the current time, we do not have federal legislation uh, that um, defines students who are slave and, or that uh, gives services to students who are slave. Um, and so with the quote you see is from IDEA and IDEA specifically says that a child may not be determined to be eligible for services if the determinant factor is a lack of instruction in reading or math. And so that or limited English proficiency, for example, but if a student has not been in school, if they've had an interruption in their education or uh, what would mean a limitation, whatever that means, right? Um, so they would not qualify for an IEP and um, most states, all states, to my knowledge at this point, the actually the IEP process would shut down, which makes sense because IDEA is a specific, uh, is specific legislation for students with disabilities, not students who are slave. Yes, they need their own legislation, but that is for a different topic, a different day. Um, 
to create um, consistency, right, uh, for great educational experiences for dual identified students, we must be bold together. I love that quote um, because it really does take um, a team of really bold individuals, curious individuals who are who want to work together to say um, this is a really complex topic, right? But um, and that's challenging and also beautiful at the same time. And we really are want to work together on uh, thinking about this in a different way and being bold and uh, being bold in how we're going to approach this. And uh, sometimes that means doing something totally different than what we were doing. And sometimes that's saying like, no, this is really working and it's great. Um, and so it's, I, I, I really like this quote because I think it's important for us to remember that, that sometimes starting certain conversations that maybe sometimes might feel a little bit uncomfortable, but you know is really so important for student support um, is worth it. Sometimes it's just running through with, uh, with a friend or another colleague, um, uh, how should I phrase this, right? So that I, I make sure that I'm approaching this in a sensitive way, uh, but that I know that this is how we'll support the student. And the idea of just, that is being bold, right? That's being daring, that's, um, that's taking the approach of, I'm gonna make sure this kid gets that support. And at the same time, recognize that this is challenging and this is complex and, and I wanna do it in a sensitive and thoughtful way. So we're gonna run through um, a couple scenarios um, with the time we have left and then I'll open up for, uh, for questions. Um, each of these scenarios, I've uh, been in each of these scenarios in a different form. Um, so they are uh, from personal experience and so I wanted to share with you in case it would be helpful for you um, in terms of thinking of a question or maybe a scenario that you've been in. So um, I'm just gonna read it out and I'll talk it through. Um, I'm the ESL teacher and I'm concerned about student A's progress in my class and the student's core classes, but I'm not sure if student needs a referral for evaluation or not. When I approached the other teachers and or special education coordinator, they told me that we should wait longer to see how student progresses. When I told them I think we need to discuss this more, I was shut down. How should I proceed so that we are making sure to fully support the student? So I want to first point out that it is really hard um, and um, difficult anytime anyone is shut down right anytime someone says like just leave it like either you know just um, wait and see like don't worry about it any of those things is not not having our voices validated um, or heard particularly when we are trying to advocate for a student um, is, is really just very hard and i want to point that out um, and so when someone is in a situation like this oftentimes what i will say is that again i know i've said this a bunch of times today but like the idea of being curious like why am i being shut down right are it am i being shut down because the special education team is super overwhelmed and they can't handle another case right now um and i i'm and therefore now i need to think about like how can i make sure this kid still gets those services um am i being shut down because um maybe there's some bias there right so um Oftentimes, as human beings, our gut, re our reaction, right? The gut reaction is, is we just want to react, right? Um, and um, I, I urge everyone in this type of situation, especially because it is so complex um, and, and sensitive, depending on what the culture is in your school, uh, is to take that step back and think for a minute of, um, like, why was I shut down here? Um, in terms of proceeding um, to fully support the kid the the data piece is really very important in terms of advocating for a kid right so if you see that student a uh you're concerned about their progress right so then the question is like well what what are you concerned about is it that you're concerned about certain progress let's say in writing reading speaking um listening um and how are you showing that data that you're concerned right so it is possible i've seen and heard this before uh special education coordinators would be like i don't know i have teachers come to me all the time and tell me they're concerned about this student right um and so being able to say listen uh here are my concerns here's why i have these concerns here's how i've paid attention to these concerns or here's how uh, I've addressed these concerns and this is why even as a result of that I'm still concerned uh, what do we need to do to move forward um, and that's right like kind of that next step next step of thinking about how am I going to make sure that this kid is really uh, getting the pro you know making progress and getting the attention that they deserve scenario two I'm the ESL teacher or special education coordinator. I have a couple teachers who have approached me about referring some of their multilingual students for special education. When I asked what makes them say that, they told me their students, quote, don't do anything, or quote, can't read in English. I already know these teachers have biases towards the multilingual learners. How do I make sure these students are supported and discuss these requests in a sensitive manner? Um, 
but I have been the special education coordinator when this has happened. <laughs> so I do speak from experience uh, from this. Uh, and I also want to point out how uh, difficult it can be and hard it can be when you already know that teachers are coming to you, right? Whether you're the ESL teacher or uh, the special education coordinator um, or whatever role, coach, anything, right? That or admin that you play in the building and someone is already coming to you and just saying, well, they can't read in English, so they should be referred um, for, for an evaluation for special education. And I think that it's really important uh, to recognize that in order to move the needle a little bit, um, any conversation that we're going to have around these kids in to fully support them means that we need to that that we do need to be sensitive. We need to think about what is this, uh, what is the way that I can approach this conversation. So, um, is for example, if I'm a special ed teacher, a special ed, uh, let's say either teacher or coordinator um, or the ESL teacher, right? Um, is there uh, someone on the admin team or another teacher that could act kind of like as a moderator uh, for us to be able to sit down and have this conversation about why they think that? Uh, is there someone on the team who can help us facilitate a conversation around what it means to say, don't do anything, right? Or can't read in English, what are your expectations, right? Um, is there a way for me to preempt, right, this type of scenario and go to, let's say, admin and say, listen, I really wanna make sure that this doesn't happen this year or, I've noticed uh, some of the teachers speaking this way. Could we please figure out a way to do some reading as a team, some professional development, you know, as a team, uh, and what that looks like? And and here's why, and here are my concerns, and because this is what's typical. Um, I want to point out that uh, none of this is easy, right? Uh, when you are working in a certain culture that may not support, uh, or particularly our multilingual learners. Um, it is definitely challenging um, and making sure to think about really who are the characters here? What is the culture here? And how am I going to move the needle a little bit? Because that lasting change is not going to generally happen overnight. It's just, it's just not. And so we need to think about how we're going to uh, have those conversations in a sensitive way um, and make it very clear to them that uh, the don't do anything uh, means that some, the right, there's a breakdown. Oh, sorry. There's a breakdown somewhere. Um, of uh, like, why aren't they receiving the instruction that they should be receiving, right? Or the support they're supposed, you know, they need to be receiving. Uh, what does it mean when you say they can't read in English, right? Um, what is that teacher doing? But instead of attacking them, how do we make sure to have these conversations uh, so that they're actually effective and supportive of everyone? Um, and for this scenario, uh, one of my students is new to the country and came from their country with an IEP. The student also has had some interrupted formal education. When I approached the special education coordinator about ensuring there was a system in place to ensure the student received an IEP in our school, I was told that wasn't possible because the student has an interrupted formal education. How do I make sure the student receives the proper services? I would like to be very clear when I say that if a student comes into your schools with an IEP from their home country, they should be getting an IEP in the United States. I recognize that depending on where they were, depending on where they went to school, depending on so many factors, that is also complex. But to deny a child who was given an IEP in their home country, an IEP in the United States, just because that there was some interrupted or limited education in some form is, uh, is really not equitable. It's not um, appropriate because what you're, what we, you're, you're basically negating, right? We are negating um, what, was very clear right in their home country um and so it's really important that we take that into account i recognize that there will be those who say but look at idea it specifically says that if they've had interrupted education they cannot get an iep um and i think this is where the advocating and the being sensitive also part comes in um and and recognizing that in general people want to do right, we, we hold the belief, we, we really want to support our kids, right? Everyone wants to support the kids in the school. And in the same way that like we, every teacher quite honestly is a language teacher, right? That everyone here is also um, a teacher to make sure that they get services they need. I, I haven't figured out how to put that in a nice compact way yet, right? But like we're all, we, we're all here to make sure kids get their services they need. So if a student comes in with an IEP from their school and then had interrupted education in some form for some reason, they should really still be getting that IEP. Now, what that evaluation looks like in terms of collecting um, classroom data, um, how long do you wait that? Those are really different questions. Um, and that is, again, really, really case by case by case. But um, even if a student comes in, for example, that they had an IEP at, at 
let's say, I don't know, seven years old in their home country and then didn't go to school for a couple of years and then let's say came here. So then we really need to think like, well, why was that student given an IEP in their home country? And shouldn't we already start this process? Um, and, I, and I wanna make sure to point out here and then um, I'll leave question, uh, time for questions is that just because you start the referral process for special education does not mean that a student will definitely get um, an IEP. It doesn't mean for sure that part of the referral process that kind of has been lost along the way is that curious piece of like something here doesn't seem like it's making sense to me or I'm concerned about this. Um, let me be curious. Uh, let, let's explore here. So I, I just want to be clear that it just because a child has an evaluation doesn't mean they're necessarily eligible for a special education. Um, but that a student, uh, in order to make sure that kids are receiving their proper services, uh, we really need to work as a team. We are, we are a village, we are a team, we are a community. Every school uh, should be looking at the IEP process, particularly for our multilingual learners in that way. There is not going to be one assessment, one evaluation that determines whether a student, again, particularly a multilingual student, um, uh, it, you know, should have an IEP or should be considered in special education. By the way, students who are not multilingual learners go through several different tests, several different evaluations. It's not just, for example, one evaluation. And so too with our multilingual learners. And we really need to see it as a team, that everyone here is part of the process. Everyone here is part of the team. And when we view it that way of how we can see this as uh, like, you know, we all are working in this together, that's how we really make sure that the kids are receiving their proper supports. And what questions do you all have? I'm here to answer them. Oh yes, we have questions. <laughs> so we will, uh, we will get to those. Let me um, share with you who is coming up next week. Yes. And then we will get to the questions. So while you are um, listening to what's coming up next week, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit those in the Q&A area. Uh, right now we're in the midst of collect collecting those. So next week we will have Tina Bean visiting with us from Silence Education and she Yay. will be discussing the power of writing in social studies. Um, this is another topic that we that seems to come back around every now and then which is I'm a content area teacher. Um, I have English learners in my classroom. Uh, we need to write. We need to engage with texts. You know what are some things I can do to, to help with that. And so Tina is going to come to share some writing strategies and that are obviously going to be great for all students, not just your English learners. So please do join us for that. You will receive an email prompting you to register or you can register on our website. Just a reminder that Saddleback Digital now exists. If you need high-low books on, in a digital format, uh, we have that for you. And there is an on-demand webinar available on our YouTube channel for you to find out more information about that or simply reach out to us. We'll be happy to give you more information. All right, let's jump into some of these questions. All right. So right now I have, let's, let's just get the, the easy ones out of the way. We had a couple <laughs> that were, about the book that you were showing supporting English learners in the classroom. Yes. We need to know who is the author of that book because I didn't quite catch it on your slide. Okay, one second. I'm actually going to pull it out of the stack that my computer is on and show it to you. <laughs> okay. um, it's Eric Haas and Julie Esparza Brown. Um, it's really uh, great. Hold on, let me just make sure this computer doesn't fall now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so um, let me do this. Yeah. Um, it's easier if I do that. Julie Esparza Brown and Eric Haas. Okay, I want to yeah. see if I can put that in the chat for yeah. people because we had a couple of questions on that. So let's yeah. do that. Um, it was Eric Haas. Yeah. And Julie Esparza Brown. There you go. Yeah. Got it's it. Great resource. Okay. Yes. Yes. I go to it over and over. <laughs> so we, yeah, so we had two questions on that. They love the quote. Uh, and we knew this question was going to come up, which was, um, what is the best way to assess a student if there was no one to do bilingual testing in a low incidence language? This is something we were discussing right before the webinar. Um, is there a simple answer to this? If we're evaluating and testing, shouldn't we be doing it in the native language? It's, it's not always possible. Like, how do we handle that? Yeah, that we, Liz and I were, yes, literally discussing that right before we got on. Um, it, this, is, this is a really, really, really complex 
topic that I, you know, I wish I had a very clear cut, better answer for. Um, for languages that we either do not have readily available um, assessments uh, for whatever reason, um, your next really best bet is, is the target language, whatever target language that is. Now, um, I do wanna point out that for students, let's say, who may be coming from countries where they speak a language um, and then we're, um, uh, what's called, we're instructed in another language in school, right? So then you you may, if you can, for example, evaluate in that language, right? So that's kind of, that would be your next bridge, depending on what the language is. Um, but um, that's where we, uh, also, obviously, we need to be really, really cognizant and careful um, about evaluating, uh, because if we can't do it in their, in their home language, um, it's not, but we don't get a full accurate picture of uh, whether or not the student needs to be referred for special education or even it, within the special education testing. Um, it's really very hard to determine uh, whether or not the student should have an IP, uh, whether they do have a learning disability. Um, and so uh, it, it, from a legal standpoint, uh, generally uh, from in state law, it will say that if a student is has shown that they are proficient in English on certain levels that you can or should um, at least do some testing in English. Um, if they are not, you're supposed to be able to access the native language, the home language. Um, if you really, really can't, then again, your best bet is to use, um, is to use uh, English. But um, I would say like the way kind of ar around that is um, to, the, the beauty of the online world is that you can often find, not every, every language, but you can often find resources within um, like kind of more uh, low incidence languages that we find in schools. And to even try and use those as resources to, un to, to get to read with them and listen to them, right? So um, a student who is reading proficiently within their language versus a student who is struggling to read in their language with what would be considered kind of a more basic text would already give you some information about that student, even if it's not an official, uh, let's say, like a special education evaluation. Thank you. Sherry Doyle, I'm, I'm calling out Sherry specifically because I, she put a question in the Q&A and I accidentally marked it as answered when we didn't answer it. So Sherry, we're going to get to your question right now because I don't want you to think that I was, you know, trying to push your question <laughs> aside. Definitely not. So Sherry wanted to know, um, are there any informal assessments available to spot check a level of an ELD student? Um, uh, just to clarify, when you say a level of like meaning an English language proficiency or I, reading? As I read it, I'm thinking language proficiency. That's how okay. I read it. Okay. Um, so this is definitely complex because you've got, right within language proficiency, we've got reading, writing, listening, speaking. So um, I'm going to go with reading. Assume, are we going to? Sure. All right. Let's, let's go with reading. reading. Okay. Let's go with reading. Okay. Um, if you're thinking about just kind of like e like easy, quick kind of spot checks, again, this really depends on grade level. Uh, if you're thinking about, let's say, like reading foundations, you definitely, you have, if you like type into Google, there are free assessments online that go through, uh, you know, foundational reading skills that can give you a sense of how a student is doing. Um, the, there are, if you, again, type into Google, like reading proficiency assessments, you will also find things that you definitely want to be careful of, for example, uh, background knowledge, right? So if you assess a student uh, to try and understand whether they're struggling with reading comprehension and you give something based on um, like something that they would have not known the topic about, then obviously that they're going to struggle in that area. So it definitely, you want to think about that in terms of assessment. So it, it kind it depends on, it depends on what you're trying to spot check, I would say, but there are, if you're looking for like, you know, phonemic awareness, phonics, those types of reading foundational skills, there are uh, definitely assessments online that, that you can turn to that will let you like have a student just kind of like read through what are essentially the way they do it is through word lists that all are under the same uh, same skill. Um, and then if a student is really struggling, for example, like with that one skill, so that already tells you something about, uh, let's say they're reading how they're, uh, how they're progressing. I could not think of the word progressing, <laughs> how they're progressing um, in their English reading. Thank you. And we had, um, I'm, I have about three questions here that I'm going to bundle together because they seem to be resource specific. Um, 
And I, I guess the, the, the general approach to these questions together would be like, is there a place we can uh, go to kind of, is there like a clearinghouse or something for, for some of these resources where I can go get information? So the first one is, do you have a resource to help aid teachers in putting individualized linguistic and cultural accommodations in IEPs? So that's one. Um, and then Lisa wanted to know about resources or ideas um, for RTI specifically for ELLs as we're thinking about going through through the process. So um, I, I don't know, I'm not asking you to like endorse any like, you know, company or product and, or something like that, but is there like a, a place you can direct people to find information and feedback on things that are out there to, so they can find what might work for their specific situation? Because every situation is unique. There's not one particular resource that's going to, you know, solve every um, situation, right? So, yes. Um... Yeah, this is definitely, <laughs> these are very, I mean, they're really important questions. They're just like big questions, you know? Big um, questions, yeah. They're big questions, yes. Um, so the first thing I'll say is in terms of like the IEP, the, I, the IEP really needs to be more updated in terms of for our multilingual students, right? Like they, there needs to be more um, there. <laughs> I would say like, it's almost like they need like a, another like, form within there uh, for kind of like those cultural linguistic um, uh, like targets, uh, things to be aware of, um, um, uh, goals, I would say. Um, so I personally have not seen like one specific area. I don't know if there are people like writing in the chat right now, maybe they would know from what they've seen. I haven't seen like one specific, um, I don't know, anyone book or anything uh, that has said like, here is a list of like that you can pull from um, in the same way that you see, let's say for like reading or, or writing, um, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I would say that a lot of it comes like, like I use that book that I showed um, as a reference. It doesn't tell you, for example, like here are the goals that you should be setting or whatever it is, but it like gives you all the things that you need to be aware of. The other uh, book that I actually, um, it's on this list somewhere also that I, the Jeanette Klingner book, she has a bunch of charts uh, in her book that I, I found very useful uh, that breaks down like uh, things you need to be aware of from a linguistic perspective as well as cultural perspective in terms of like uh, what you should think of. And then if a student is struggling with this kind of, she doesn't really say it as a goal, but like kind of where you would expect them to be. So um Yes, name of the book. One second, I'm trying to find it. I definitely have, ah, here we go. I have it in this stack. <laughs> um, it's, uh, why do English language learners struggle with reading? Um, so uh, this is also a very useful um, book because she like really takes it through um, like different assessment, like the different tiers. She goes through the whole RTI uh, different tiers, what you should be thinking of. She puts it in charts. So I, I use that. Th those two books are, I would say, like my biggest references when it comes to um, multilingual learners um, and special education. I have others, but those are two big yeah. ones for me. Yeah. We have way more questions coming in than we'll be able to get to at this point <laughs> okay. in time. I do have one more that um, it's, it's actually really, really important. And uh, Beth, thank you for chiming in to um, help me focus on this question because I think you're right. It is super important. Beth Skelton is with us today. So hi, Beth. Um, <laughs> yeah, these are, I mean, you can see how this could easily be like a three hour session, if not like yeah. a multi day session, right? There's, yeah. Yeah. there's so many questions coming in. Yes. Um, so um, everybody who has submitted a question that, that we don't get to live, we will get to you. I will make sure to accumulate your questions and make sure that Orly gets them. And together we yeah. will kind of tag team to make sure that you get the answers that you need. But Tiffany asked, um, what do you say when it said that students can't double dip for services, meaning ESL yeah. and resource, or that resource minutes supersede language services? So the, um, Tiffany says, I know students can legally receive both services, but how do we have that conversation in a respectful way? Yeah. Very, very is, important question. Oh, such an important question. Yes. Um, okay. Um, this is one of those types of conversations, like I said, that you definitely want to talk out with someone first um, because it can go in a lot of different ways. Um, 
the idea of even kind of like dipple, double dipping for services um, really like negates that student's experience as both a multilingual learner and as a child who's right been like dual, uh, dual um, recognized, dual um, identified, right? So that child is legal, legally, right, should be given, is, is, has the right to all of those services and should be given um, all of those services. When it comes to having that conversation, um, and I know I said this like a bunch of times throughout the webinar about like being curious, like honestly, my first question would be to anyone who says that is like, what, what, like what is bringing on, right, that comment? Right, like why is someone, why are we like thinking that either one takes precedent over the other? Why are we mentioning that? I, I would say like that's kind of my first, my like gut reaction is like why, why, why is someone like almost saying like they shouldn't be getting those services um, as kind of my first uh, thought. Um, I think in terms of having that, the respectful, having it in a sensitive and respectful way is to sensitively show them um, that the student needs both of those services, right? So like, it's like, is there a reason why we would say that a student shouldn't receive those services? Like the student is a multilingual learner, right? So meaning the student needs those services. So it's like, let's imagine what it would be like to take away those services, right? And the, um, I'm sure many of you have seen like even PDs where it's like, you have to like, like the other person is speaking in a different language and it's like really hard to understand what's going on because let's say you don't speak that language. So like if we took away those services, it's like, let's, let's get the other person in the shoes of this, of the, of the child, right, of, of what that means. And then what if we took away those services or we made one service like more important than the other service? Um, and I think so, I, I think part of the having those conversations in a sensitive way is helping the adults to see what it is to be that child. And in the same way that it's like really, really hard um, for like someone who's literate to possibly understand what it means to not be literate, it's really hard to understand like if you are a dual identified student, um, how challenging that could possibly be. Um, and so my approach to that is really um, working with them to show them what it's like for that kid and why they, not just from a legal standpoint, because sometimes that like shuts people down when you're like, this is their legal right, but showing them um, like, how this is what it means to support this kid. This is what they're experiencing. Um, let's like show compassion and empathy and let's get you to understand what it's like for this kid um, so that we can uh, show you how important both these services are and how one isn't above the other. And we have to work as a team to make sure they are getting the appropriate services for the amount of time that they are, that they are legally deserving of that, right? Um, and that they should be, should be getting all those services. Very, very complicated questions today, and yeah. <laughs> and we are about out of time. But I want everybody to know who submitted into the Q and A, um, the um, like Julie and um, Adalia and Sarah. Uh, we see your questions. We just don't have time to get to them live, but we will make sure that we um, email you uh, and yeah. and try to get you point you in the right direction. And that goes for everybody else um, who submitted questions. And we thank you so much for your participation today, and uh, for your your interest, and again, let's go back to this word curiosity, um, the fact that we all took time out of our day today to come here and learn to how we can do better and be better for our multilingual learners and make sure that we are getting the right plan in place for them. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, and I just commend all of you for taking the time to be here and, and ask these questions. So we'll do our part to make sure we get you what you need. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please find us on whatever your favorite social media platform is. We are there and we are happy to connect with you. And just a big thank you to everybody who joined us today for all that you do and to Orly, I mean, for putting this together. I mean, what a massive task. This is, like I said, our third, third webinar on our topic. Check out our YouTube channel. We have two other multilingual and special ed related webinars and our presenters for those other webinars they worked. I mean, you could it's a passion project in a sense, like making sure people have this information. And there's so many different angles. So um, this is not the end for you. You can definitely check out our other webinars. And Orly, thank you so much. Amazing job. Um, and we'll see everybody next week. Take care. Thanks, everyone.